Okay, well, welcome everyone, and we hope soon to welcome one of our speakers, Martin Poon, um, who is participating remotely in uh, Aberdeen. Uh, this is the uh, final uh, Glasgow Forum uh, for Scots Law uh, session of the year, and um, we've been focusing so far on the uh, role of the Scottish Law Commission, uh, um, but for today's topic, the Scottish Law Commission were conspicuous by their absence and sense. I hope that folk we're going to talk about today um, it is about that decision to take, about what difference it has made uh, that the SLC has, has not been um, involved in the uh, proposals uh, around uh, the Land Reform Bill, thinking a little bit about why that might be the case. And what its consequences would be. Uh, to think about that, uh, we have three folk uh, to talk to you. Um, first of all, we hope Martin Coombe uh, of the University of Aberdeen, who was uh, part of the Land Reform Review Group, um, who produced the report which is background into uh, the current uh, Land Reform Bill. Uh, we have Dr. Joe Robbie uh, from Glasgow, uh, who gave evidence uh, to the uh, Rural Affairs Committee, which is the lead holding committee, uh, considering the bill and uh, wrote the, the main uh, piece of written evidence from Glasgow University uh, on the bill and uh, we uh, to say after not uh, Jill said the piece and after we've all spoken uh, for a little while uh, about some of, the, some of our reflections on this process and then I hope that there will be lots of Vigorous discussion uh, from the floor and perhaps on Twitter. I don't know, are we live tweeting? Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know if anyone is joining us online via the live stream, uh, apart from Malcolm. No, <laughs> Um, if they are, uh, they're very welcome. Um, we'll, I think we'll give Malcolm another couple of minutes because he kind of came into this process at the earliest stage and could probably be most dealt with case if he was the person speaking um, first, uh, but more generally. Happy to. I'd ask uh, Jill to begin with your reflections on the one for project. Uh, thank you, Johnny. And I think actually what I'm going to say is a bit different to what Malcolm's going to say anyway, because he's going to talk about being part of the Land Reform and Review Group, which I, as we all know, wasn't. So I want to kind of focus on Johnny's initial question about what kind of things I think would have been different if the Scottish Law Commission were part of the process, and what advantages that would bring, but also maybe some potential drawbacks. Just like my written and oral evidence to RACI, the Rural Affairs and Climate Change Environment Committee, I'm mostly talking about parts one to five and actually mostly focusing on part five, particularly the right to buy. So I have a couple of advantages. Um, the, the biggest thing that I think would have been a benefit of the Social Commission taking part of the process would be involvement with theoretical underpinning. So I think one notable difficulty that we've experienced in land, land reform process so far is a lack of discussion about the kind of conceptual framework of what is trying to be achieved. <coughs> There's been very much substantive discussion about why, for example, we're trying to redistribute land and what are the principles of, that are underlying this decision. The policy memorandum of the bill and the Land Reform Review Group report are useful to a certain extent, but I think a lot more discussion could and should be had. So there have been a couple of suggestions here and there. Uh, Professor Don Lovett um, gave a presentation about property law in Louisiana here at Glasgow, and he very, in a very casual way, suggested the possible utility of the reliance principle. Uh, 
um, that's been outlined by Joseph Singer from Harvard Law School. This, in the context of land reform, this view has its difficulties, and um, as was pointed out by Malcolm at the time, because often communities have been shut out um, from the land, or there's no community present, which means that there's no ability to develop some sort of reliance on the land, which can then subsequently be protected by law. So there's a, there was a problem with considering that potential option for a theoretical underpinning. I posed the question at the legal theory discussion group whether um, Gregory Alexander, another American actor, um, his theory of the social obligation norm in American property law could assist in um, providing some sort of theoretical basis for land reform. The consensus among that group was that this theory was actually quite conservative not nearly as progressive as it really needed to be, and that his arguments were not sufficiently theoretically robust for use in uh, the land reform process. So that was, I mean, these two, they're very small moments when the theory has been considered, but they were actually really useful in showing us, showing me, what we really need. Um, so I think if the SLC had been involved, there would have been more engagement with CD. Now this might sound like a typical kind of academic fixation on abstract matters, which might not bother the people in the room, but um, I think the lack of theoretical underpinning has two quite significant consequences. One is lack of adherence with the existing law, which means that um, the decisions of Scottish ministers, potentially using their new powers in, in the bill as it's passed, could be unpredictable. And secondly, it's linked to that, is that there's the argument that not engaging with the conceptual framework that limits the impacts of land reform. So if these changes were seen as a development or an expression of general principles of Scots law, the reform could have the potential to assist in our kind of transformation of an understanding of property law and see it as a continuation of another process that's maybe started at an earlier stage. So if it's just if land reform is just seen as, for example, with the right to buy as a new esoteric uh, right that stands on its own, this kind of transformative power is it might be lost or at least quite greatly curtailed. So that's one aspect, one advantage I think that would have been would have been had if SLC had been part of it. The second one is uh, comparative research. So. The um, SPICE actually issued an international perspectives on land reform paper, um, and that is, in a sense, good for what it does. It's produced in a very limited period of time. It noted that there is a very small amount of comparative research on the nature and regulation of ownership generally, so it does contribute something. Um, but there's, in terms of the right to buy, there are two pages which are given to um, first the preemptive rights uh, in France and then uh, a, a forced sale um, uh, discussion about the law in, in Germany for agricultural land. I think a far greater amount of comparative research could, should have been undertaken. These two examples in themselves could have been discussed in a lot more detail and we're all convinced, well at least I'm convinced of the benefits of comparative law for learning about the mistakes and the successes which other jurisdictions have experienced and then helping, allowing that to help us make our own good laws. Again, it's the practice in the Scottish Law Commission, as we all know, to carry out detailed comparative research um, and this presumably would have been done if the SLT had been involved in the land reform process. My third advantage would be about human rights. Um, so human rights have been considered to a certain extent in the policy memorandum. There was a, there was needed though a significant amount of input in terms of written and oral evidence on human rights um, concerns. In particular, I think people like organisations like Faculty of Advocates submitted some supplementary evidence on human rights issues. Um, 
It's been shown very recently with the Salveson against Riddle investigation. It's crucial to um, act as Scottish Parliament, of course, to consider human rights issues and the consequences of not doing so are quite extreme. I think the Scottish Law Commission has significant expertise in passing laws which affect property rights. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I've done it in an ECHR compliant manner, so abolishing superiorities, um, under the abolition of feudal tenure, converting long leases to ownership and the Long Leases Scotland Act, which just just happened the other day. Very exciting. So again, if the SLD had been involved in this process, I think it was at least more likely that human rights issues would have been considered in a more in-depth way, and that is therefore leading to a less likely, leading to less likelihood of a successful challenge. Final benefit I want to mention um, is largely about procedure or structural issues. So this was kind of a large part of my evidence after consultation with my colleagues um, to Raki, which was that there was a lack of uh, clarity in the drafting of the bill. There was a large amount of um, delegated powers contained in the bill. And there's also the potential complexity created, and this is the establishment of a new right and actually we've got three other rights already in existence. So I think guys we're going to have to switch to state to get the ultimate okay. section over it. Okay. Should I keep talking? Yeah, please yeah. do. Please okay. Do. Um, so at the mo if this bill goes through and we introduce this new right, we've also got four different um, rights which are available for communities to have some sort of right over land. Looking closely at these different rights, they all actually have slightly, it seems, different tests and different procedural requirements. Which I think it might be on. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, fantastic, sorted. Can, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Fantastic, we can hear you too. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hi. Glad to have you with us. My point, it's good to be here. <laughs> So, can we turn him down a bit? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, quite loud. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's good. Like, yeah. Can, can you, you say, say something? Okay, hello. Oh, yeah, that's okay. uh, just, just to bring up speed, uh, Jill is in, in, in the middle of reflecting on uh, the advantages of, of the right come from SLC involvement and when she's finished talking we'll ask you to speak for 10 minutes. Okay. I can give a quick summary from you, Malcolm, uh, just at the end. Conclusion. Yeah. Conclusion. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of talking about the structural problems that have emerged in the land reform bill, uh, reliance on, on delegated powers, a lack of clarity, the fact that we're creating a lot of different diverse rights. Um, although it would be dependent on the remit of the SLC if they considered something like this, they have shown, um, Commission has shown that it can produce clear uh, property law statutes which are not dependent on uh, subordinate legislation and it would be possible to consider a consolidation exercise um, if, if the SLC took this a project like this on. So those are my ideas on benefits. What would be the potential drawbacks? Well, the process with the Wednesday the Scottish Law Commission would take a significant period of time. So for feudal abolition, the discussion paper came out in 1991, the report was 1999, and the Act was 2000. You might think, okay, so feudal abolition, massive project. For tenements, the discussion paper was 1990, the report was in 1998 and the act in 2004. So something that's not necessarily even a huge project, take, they take a significant amount of time. <coughs> in comparison with drafting a bill one year and the next year's law, I, I think that's quite different. There's also the question of whether the SLC is the appropriate body to deal with such a political area of law. Um, and as we all know, land reform has become a really hot topic politically. And we heard from Shona Wilson Stark in this in the Glasgow Forum that um, generally the commissions are dissuaded 
from trying to reform political areas of law. Shona did, however, question whether this was a valid distinction to make um, and whether it limits the SLT involvement when they could actually make a valid contribution. I think she talked quite a bit about <coughs> criminal law and the fact that it was basically being sidelined because it's seen as too political. Um, the Land Reform Review Group and um, the parliamentary process though, had stirred a significant amount of debate with the wider public and that kind of engagement with on a matter of such importance with everyone in Scotland, I think, to some extent, is a valuable thing. There is a potential as well that SLT involvement might have limited the possibility for really significant radical reform and radical change, um, although we have seen through this process that there have been more calls for a fulfillment of a much greater radical program and it remains to be seen whether this will actually happen without um, SLT involvement. So my kind of summary for everyone in the room, and I suppose Malcolm as well, is that um, the advantages that would have taken place if, or would have been harvested if the SLT had been part of the process, I think, would be greater discussion of the theoretical underpinning of the process and what we're trying to do with land reform, a greater amount of comparative research um, to see the benefits and, uh, or the, the successes and failures of other jurisdictions, more detailed discussion of human rights, um, less, potentially less uh, problems with the structural problems like reliance on delegated legislation um, and this complex landscape that we've now created, whereas the disadvantages would be it would take a significant period of time and it might not be the appropriate body to deal with such a political area of law and maybe we wouldn't have such a radical out outcome at the end. Okay. Uh, is this being recorded? Uh, yes. yes. Right, cool, because um, <laughs> the land of the things were under sort of Chatham House rules, so um, I will uh, carefully dodge around any issues that I think um, would sort of someone like Robin Callender or Alison Elliott would skip, pick up the phone to me and say, wait a minute, why are you speaking about that? Um, so um, there's maybe a few things to um, mention which are sort of inspired a bit by what Jill said, um, and then I'll go into what sort of the, the sort of points I mentioned in my email for an order of what I was going to speak about. Um, yeah, the Scottish Law Commission have been involved in things that are sort of overtly political or, or make sort of policy choices, but what they tend to do, or certainly what they did with the succession stuff, was make certain proposals and then give that over and sort of say, here's three options, over to you guys to think about it. Um, and whether or not that would have worked for land reform, I don't know, but at least get, it, 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 it would have, it, it, it's, an, it, it's an alternative approach. The other thing though, I think that, um, is pretty important in terms of knowing the limits of the Scottish Law Commission and getting involved in something like this is that, well, lawyers, even land lawyers, don't necessarily know that much about land use. Uh, and I think it would have been tricky to uh, try and get the sort of expertise that you saw um, in the Land Reform Review Group and in the separate agricultural holdings legislation review group, did, have you spoken about the AH, AHLRG at all, or have you? Because the other thing, as well, is of course, um, I mean, part ten of the land reform bill is all agri holdings, and uh, th a lot of that stems from the, the agricultural holdings, se the separate Richard Lockhead chaired review, which. Um, took a slightly different different approach to the Land Reform Review Group and obviously was looking at the tenant sector in a lot more detail. Um, so yeah, um, th there were a lot of people involved in, well there were five people involved in that, including a tenant farmer, uh, and, and on the law side of it you had um, Crispin Agnew Lochnaw and Hamish Lean, uh, a partner at Stronach. So sure there was legal expertise, but it brought in different people which I think I think is probably needed for something like land reform, which is making, it's steering people towards certain land uses um, in certain ways. So um, 
coming back, what else was it to say? Um, yeah, um, my own sort of how else the report could have been different if the Scottish Law Commission had been involved. Um, the Land Reform Review report that is. Um, it could have had numbers, <laughs> it could have had a number of recommendations, and it could have had an executive summary. That was probably the main thing that they got wrong in the Land Reform Review Group, if you ask me. They didn't have... <laughs> it, seriously, seriously, it gave, it gave you hit for people like Andy Whiteman when they were blogging about it. It's like, where are the numbers? Uh, and I mentioned that in my own sort of Edinburgh Law Review contribution to the um, or reporting on the Review Group. So, but be that as it may, um, I think... One thing, and I'm happy enough sort of saying this, and I don't think I'm breaking any confidences when I'm saying this, there was one stage in a meeting when I said, guys, you know, we're getting towards the end of um, our meetings, and you guys, the, the sort of four people who were involved in the group, chaired by the special advisor, Robin Callender, um, you're going to go away and sort of, you're going to start drafting something now, and there were lots of questions about human rights and sort of uh, just how far they could go in terms of proposals. And like, have you ever looked at a law commission report in terms of seeing what it says at the front and talking about legislative competence and talking about what you can do in terms of devolution, ECHR, EU, etc., etc.? And I'm not sure if I'll, I'll be charitable. Not everyone in the room had thought about that. So I think, um, yeah, the it, it, it could have drawn things together in a slightly... Because there were some people in that group who had not been involved in a reform exercise like that, but then there were others who'd been involved in, in, many, in, in many other things as well, which comes back to what I was actually going to say to start with then. So that was me sort of ad-libbing furiously. Com coming back to what I was going to say, and I sort of mentioned this in my email to you, Johnny, in terms of what I might speak about. The, the group itself got constituted in 2012. Um, th why, why it got constituted in the way it did, I mean, that's just the, the Scottish government sort of decided to do it that way. Who knows? I think there was a there was a lot of questions about timing, if you ask me, and I'm sort of on the record in one of my own blogs saying I think they, they wanted to make sure they had a report. In my head, I think they wanted to have something before the referendum, but they didn't actually want to legislate on the matter before the referendum. I think they, they wanted to sort of be able to show this is what we will, will have lined up. Uh, but anyway, so be that as it may, they formed the group in 2012. It had three members to start with. Um, how much do people in the room know about the LRRG in terms of the way um, it was structured? Have you have you sort of read the report? Don't assume a lot, Molly. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, it's it's a, good, it's a good way of life generally. Try not to assume things. Yeah. Um, three people. <laughs> three people involved. Um, Alison Elliott, Jim Hunter, uh, who is a Highland historian and also a land reform commentator, and he's been involved in a few, particularly Highland uh, public bodies in the past. And he's got a new book out about the Sutherland Clearances, which you might have heard of, set a rift upon the world. Um, so uh, I got a copy of that for my mum for our Christmas. Don't show her this recording. Um, so um, the, uh, it, it's really good. Um, I've had a couple, I've read a couple of pages of it before. Anyway, uh, so Jim Hunter and another person called Sarah Skerritt, um, and they produced an interim report sort of maybe, I don't know, a year after they'd been appointed in the, or maybe about 10 or so advisors. Um, and the interim report went down. I think the Scottish Land and the States were quite happy with it, which from a land reform point of view, if the people who don't want land reform are happy with the report, then you can imagine the people who wanted land reform were not happy with the report and <laughs> probably would have yeah, well, again, I'll be diplomatic and leave it at, leave it at that. Brian Wilson call, called it um, something like the most useless 40 pages ever committed to print um, on, the to on the topic of land reform, because it, it, it was pretty insipid stuff. And roughly at that time, um, Sarah Skerritt, through pressure of work, went back to SRUC, the Scottish Rural College, and Jim Hunter, for whatever reason, left the group, leaving the group of one. At that point, Alison Elliott uh, was of a, a group of one. Um, and the group was then expanded to include another three members and one chair. Uh, well, so no, not one chair, one special advisor. So there was someone from the Lowlands, a guy called Pip Taboo, came on board. A guy called Ian Cook, who'd been involved a lot with uh, urban development. And who else came on as an advisor? 
uh, on a, as a member. There was one other person came on as a member uh, whose name escapes me, and then Robin Callender came on as uh, as the special advisor, and they and they appointed some extra advisors, including me. So I joined on as an advisor in sort of early-ish 2013 and went to my first meeting in, I think it was Inverness in May or June 2013. And, yeah, so the the report sort of, that so that was in the back of the interim report, people fed into, um, well, obviously, the feedback to the interim report uh, and the reaction to that. Um, also, at the time, I was sort of um, asked to do a bit of work in relation to part, part two of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 in terms of bringing the community right to buy up to date a little bit. And that strand of work was taken up in the Community Empowerment Bill. So a lot of the amendments that have been made already to the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, well, yeah, th th that came from the Land Reform Review Group work, was put into Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. Um, and as far as I can tell, um, it, I think it's April 15th, most of the amendments are going to come into force, thanks to a statutory instrument. So, yeah, that, that, that's already been through the parliamentary process. And I think um, some of the streamlining of the sort of part two right to buy, the stuff about sort of no longer having to be a community limited by, a company limited by guarantee to be a community, no longer having to sort of strictly comply with certain ballot requirements. So, yeah, these are things that... I mean, the Scottish Law Commission could have been involved in that, but I don't think necessarily it needed to be because it was reflecting on how communities had got on um, with the process themselves. And a lot of the people who were involved in the Land Reform Review Group probably had more insight into that um, than Scottish Law Commissioners would have had. Um, and that stuff has now been through the Parliament and has got through. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see soon whether or not that leads to an increase in the uptake of um, the Part 2 scheme in, in the coming years. I, mean, I think, um, as, a, as a bit of an aside, has anyone seen the report that actually Sarah Skerritt, a name I mentioned already, and various others did into the impact of the community right to buy? There was a report produced by the Scottish Government looking at the 18, count them, 18 rights to buy that have like, actually gone through uh, the Part 2 scheme and trying to work out whether or not, um, well, just whether the, it's it's gone well for um, the communities and so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, so will 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 there, will there be more uptake now that we've got the 2015 Act on the books and it will make things a bit better? Who knows? Um, I suspect it will make a massive sea change. Um, what then about, the, so then the Land Reform Review Group obviously made a number of proposals um, which were, I mean, they were overtly political. Things like um, having a cap on land ownership. They didn't say whether it would be a set figure or a set percentage of Scotland. But yeah, that's something that I, I can't imagine the Scottish Law Commission would have looked at something like that in the same way as a group like the Land Reform Review Group would have looked at it uh, in if, that, that was a fairly convoluted way of saying that, but hope you know what I mean, meant there are other things like um, the the idea about restricting uh, ownership to uh, entities registered in the EU. Again, is that the kind of thing that the Law Commission could have looked at? Probably if they'd been told to look at it directly, they would have looked at it. But whether or not, if they, would they have done that of, the, of their own motion? I'm not sure. Um, the Land Reform Review Group came away saying, we recommend an absolute right to buy for um, agricultural tenants, even though there was the separate review going on uh, to agricultural holdings that um, I mentioned, the one chaired by Richard Lockhead. I mean, that's an overtly political thing to propose. Um, and indeed, one of the advisors to the Land Reform Review Group, a chap called Andrew Bruce Wooten, who worked for, uh, or still works for Athol Estates, sort of resigned as an advisor at the 11th hour before the report came out saying, I can't put my name to anything that proposes an absolute right to buy. So again, is that the kind of thing that um, the, the Scottish Law Commission would have signed up to? Suspect not. That's a bit of a ramble through... Um, 
what I was planning to say, not not a very coherent structure. Um, I hope that's been a useful enough insight all the same. Um, what do you guys think of that? Any thoughts? Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to say something for a little while, and then we're going to go to general discussion. So okay. Great um, so, uh, <coughs> yeah, thanks. Um, but when I was starting to think about these issues, I guess, I, like Jill, I, I thought, um, first of all, about Shona's talk, um, which opened our uh, consideration of the Scottish Law Commission uh, and its work this session, and I, I must confess, despite having worked in the Law Commission, I had just assumed that there was something in the Law Commission's constitution which said that um, the Commission shouldn't handle um, matters of uh, political uh, controversy, that it was a technical body. And, um, I, I found some of those arguments uh, about the difficulty of, um, uh, of drawing a line around that and the potential for neglect of certain important areas of, of law um, to be quite um, persuasive. Uh, but I think when we look at the Land Reform Bill, it, it's useful, uh, as it's been hinted at already, to try and um, reflect a little bit on the experience of, of the, um, uh, the succession project uh, and perhaps to set that in contrast um, to the, the property law reviews. Um, Pretty much everybody accepts that um, the Law Commission's involvement in abolition feudal tenure and sort of related projects related to uh, law tenement uh, and law releases have been very successful in insofar as the problems with the legislation on the whole of the people who distribute those problems to changes that were made in Parliament rather than what the Commission did. Um, the succession stuff has proved much more controversial um, and well, whether the legislation ever comes out from what form it's going to come out, I think, it is um, much more uh, open to question. Well, what does that tell us? Well, I suspect that it might tell us that um, the Scottish Law Commission is very good at delivering a policy where there is broad consensus about what needs to happen already. Um, and that there are, in my view, actually, really quite bad at broad theoretical consideration. The thing that was missing from the succession project was any serious theoretical engagement. As Malcolm said, they kind of tried to come up with a couple of, of, of options, but they, um, they didn't um, it, it examine the, the, the social or, or, or political um, theory. So I, I think I'd maybe really take a slightly different view for me, Jill, in terms of the advantages. They're good at a particular kind of theoretical analysis, which is really important. Namely, the theoretical analysis which enables you to join up what you are doing with the, with the rest of the law. Mm -hmm. But um, hitherto, they have not shown themselves, and given their staff that quite a of the work to show themselves, um, capable of building a bridge between law and wider political and uh, social issues. Um, and I think that that's something that as people with broad responsibility for the development of Scots law in the next 50 years, around the table, um, I think we've got to worry about that because um, I can't think of anyone really who is, um, or any significant body of learning which is bridging those gaps successfully in Scotland more broadly. Um, I think, um, well, Malcolm, what you were saying about the um, the policy expertise of, of the land reform review group is, is absolutely right, but sort of as a converse to the, the law commission experience, what, what we saw there is that they, they just focused on the policy and attributed much less effort to the way in which um, the policy was to be delivered than would have been the case with, with the SLC. So if we can kind of contrast the bodies, we have one body which focuses on refining policy exclusively, I think, doesn't really think all that carefully about how it's going to be delivered. And, and then another body which is very good at coming up with relatively rigorous methods of, of delivery, but has no experience being able to set policy. That leads me to think that actually there might have been a role um, for the Scottish Law Commission in this process, but not by means of a sort of standard um, 
sort of program floor reform uh, project, but rather as a, by means of a ministerial reference. I think I think we would be a case for getting the land reform review group to come up with their proposals first, mm -hmm. and then for the the SLC to be given a remit with a set specified set of policy outcomes. And um, one of the things that I think has been very difficult about the debate so far is that we've tried to have the policy argument and the delivery argument at the same time, mm -hmm. and largely that has meant that the the delivery side has been dragged out a few noble um, exceptions because the other stuff is, is perhaps more exciting to people but also until you've decided on what your policy is it's actually difficult to work out whether what is being proposed in terms of detail is going to deliver what people think it, it should be um, delivering. <laughs> delivery absolutely yeah, in terms of, I, I take the point that, yeah, the policy and the delivery stuff is definitely being looked at at the same time, but in theory that that perhaps shouldn't have happened because the Land Reform Review Group gathered loads of evidence and had 390, 400 odd people responding to them for their call, call for evidence. Then the Scottish Government had their consultation and then the committees had their uh, call for evidence as well. So it's just the, the, the fact is no one has let the policy stage finish. I think that if, if, if someone had said stop the music, you know, we, we've had all the consultation we want, now we're just going to go and implement it. Now, I know that's that's difficult to do because obviously the legislative process has got three stages and you're going to be able to sort of intervene at different points of the legislative process. But, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's everyone, every, every stage of the land reform process from LRG sort of feeding into the interim report, final report, initial, like program for government being announced at the end of 2014, this stuff being announced for the land reform bill, the, the bill being published itself in June, everyone's piled in at so many different stages and made it about whichever area they're interested in. So, so yeah, I think the policy thing, it's just always going to be there. Yeah, but I, I think that something like a reference to the Scots Law Commission for the purposes of delivery would have I thought we'd have isolated that process to some extent. It could have tried to cocoon it, but I don't know if it would have managed. I mean, I think one thing it would have done, one thing that I think you can see is missing from, from, from the land reform bill as compared with SLC bills, is um, the use of a, of a legal advisory group who are commenting on a draft bill. So uh, if you look at the way that they put together the stuff on movable uh, transactions, the way that the abolition field tenure stuff was put together, and um, the 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 actual text of the bill was discussed for years in some cases certainly for months and um, with people whose job it is to make sure that the legal rules work and um, before we got to the stage of something being introduced in in, uh, uh, in parliament um, I, in my, my own evidence i'm skeptical of uh, the possibility of really improving the drafting much during the parliament's process say having read the, the report of, of the committee from stage one, I, I am not comforted much because on the whole, typically what they say is, well, yeah, this, uh, that's fair enough. Yeah, maybe there should be a little bit more information than this. This is something the ministers really should think about. Um, we'd like you to reflect on, on that. Um, but, I mean, there is a limit to what we can do in a, in a stage one procedure, I think. But it, it's very hard for a body like the Parliamentary Committee um, to um, give the kind of rigorous structural scrutiny which which the, the law commission um, process uh, would bring, um, we should move to general discussion. Just one other. Yeah, just when you're talking about that um, policy, like the stopping the policy argument and moving on to the yeah. legal argument, I'll be quite interested to see. I think the same thing happens with cohabitation provisions and the succession provisions for cohabitants that are in the Family Law Scotland Act 2006. So when they brought in that legislation, that act is a bit of a jumble of different things, but the mm -hmm. cohabitation provisions are contained in there and when that legislation was brought in, the argument, all the debates, it was a government bill, it wasn't a law commission bill, although there had been previous law commissions like Donor Rights for Cohabitants, and when the bill was brought in, uh, the discussion was completely dominated by um, 
arguments about all whether marriage is separate from cohabitation, and you know there's obviously a big religious lobby there trying to who didn't want to have to have any rights at all because it was a thing to decide to take marriage and that sort of stuff. And the, eventually, obviously, the legislation was passed, but the cohabitation legislation is a bit of a shambles. Yeah. And subsequently to that, in the Law Commission succession report, albeit that that is quite political, I don't think the cohabitation bits no, of it are politically political. And I haven't really seen a lot of discussion about it in the ongoing, like the recent consultation on succession. But the Law Commission's recommendations for changes in the legislation here I really like and think that part of the bill, which is basically t taking whole cloth from the Law Commission bill, is much better legislation than the legislation that we've currently got on succession. So I'll be interested, I mean, I don't know, no information yet on what all these consultations are going to do, but it will be interesting to see whether that is an example of where a politically contentious government bill has led to maybe not great legislation technically, but a very clear principle of what the law is about, i.e. cohabitants should have rights in succession. Mm -hmm. Then followed up by okay. technical legal consideration by the law commission leading to new legislation, potentially, if that ever happens. Well, it never occurred to me that an act of Scottish Parliament could be an interim step, but I suppose there's... No, I know it's not ideal, obviously. We could do better, but just, you know, be interesting. It shouldn't have been, maybe have been that the 2003 Act was the interim step, you know? For introducing rights to buy, because that was just you try and justify some sort of preemption right. It's kind of almost a quite similar argument. Then you're just taking it slightly further to have forced yes. sale in a way, still attempting redistribution. Yeah, I, but I think the policy here is bigger. I, I mean, the, the, the last maybe I'm, I'm well, you know, hopefully you can correct my gross ignorance in this model, but. My, my impression was that, that the big politically con contentious stuff that the Land Reform Review Group came up with didn't make it into the legislation. So yeah. my understanding of the legislation is that there, that there is no cap on ownership and that they decided not to restrict... And it's not the committee report either, which is the more important thing actually. The, the, uh, in terms of the various things the committee said, let's maybe bring this back. They didn't say anything about the cap on ownership, so I think that's dead. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know what that tells us. Maybe that actually... Um, having a having a report drafted by a, a bold outside organisation doesn't get you too far further forward because it's still got to get through the parliamentary process and our politicians are, are, are not going to take too bold an approach. I, I think on the on the e membership thing, that just to fill people in in case they haven't had an opportunity to look at this stuff in the past, um, one, one of the main concerns that the Land Reform Review Group had and which to a certain extent is driven some of the land registration stuff, is, is access of information about who controls land in Scotland. And I think it's fair to say that the, the, the move to restrict ownership to um, um, either natural persons or, or juristic persons registered in EU member states was about, about, about transparency of ownership. Undoubtedly. Um, and the, the Scottish Government felt, oh, they weren't sure that this would really deal with this problem, um, and I think they, they thought they were doing something that was bolder, actually, when they came up with their weird information gathering um, provision. Um, but they, they... They're hiding, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so what they said is that basically you can request information from the owner as to who tells them what to do. Um, go stop. And, <laughs> Um, the Scottish Minister can make regulations about, about, it. about yeah. that topic. Um, and if I understood the report to read very quickly this morning, um, correctly, essentially, they said we don't think that this is going to work. Need more detail. Yeah. So they, they couldn't discuss, they couldn't sufficiently discuss the proposal because they weren't filled in. Yeah. So we need to know more detail before, and they needed more detail at the next stage. Of and, uh, I mean, I think um, that move actually the law commission would be more likely to come up with a kind of proposal um that was in the land reform review groups thing than what than with what the government came up with i think certainly maybe not in the context of the law commission but george Gretton has suggested something similarly why he was a commissioner it's not in, in, in the context of, of, of the commission um but i suppose that the, this that episode points us to the 
the final concern, which is that whether the Law Commission or any other body comes up with a piece of legislation at the end, there is always the risk that something crazy happens in, at the parliamentary stage. Yes. Um, and I think this is an example of that. Certain aspects of the, the Title Act are, are examples of, of the same process. But I do wonder if, if a Law Commission bill is a little less vulnerable um, uh, to that kind of tinkering because, um, well, one, because of the new expedited procedure, although it would be hard to use for one. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't want to, I suppose. Um, but also because there's a, a well established principle of providing a detailed piece of legislation which is not for um, what the for, for what Hollywood should do, whereas I think they would have felt less constrained by the detail of the land reform review group's um, provisions. Um, what do we learn from all of that? Well, I, I think, um, to, to, my, to my mind, we, we learned that one of the, the major difficulties here has been a, a, a lack of linkage between technical law reformers and people who, who set policy and theoreticians. Um, and I suppose there's a case for saying that the people who have the major responsibility for filling that gap are, are the, the legal academy, because the people with the time, perhaps with the connections, um, to try to join the dots. But, um, I, well, let's hear from some contributions from the floor and hopefully more from Jill and from Malcolm. Just to point out about they have the, the stage one report has suggested that in reintroducing the EU rules. <coughs> I'm guessing Malcolm, you picked that up as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So they put, they put suggest they didn't. They, <laughs> they say they do not re recommend deleting section six, 35 and 36 in their entirety, which was suggested by some, which I think was suggested by one. Um, one of yeah. One yeah. very important one. Um, uh, they, they did a attempt to, or they suggested reintroducing the EU entity rule. Yeah. As an aside, can I say that um, if anyone's speaking other than Ross, Jill, or Johnny, can you say who you are? Because you can only see three people. Right. I, I can pan the camera. Oh, you are. You're a nice Frankie, so, but uh, there's if there's you want to pan, you can, but whatever. Well, well there were parts of notes. I think that might be quite slow and painful. So, yeah. <laughs> um, thoughts from anyone else? I do criminal law, this is all beyond me. <laughs> but do you, is there the same tension between sort of poli policy type reform and technical technical reform? I think the issue here is that it can kind of fall in the crack between policy and, and technique. I, I'm not really sure. I mean, the, the, the Law Commission, the Scots Law Commission, hasn't really done anything with, with criminal law as far as I'm aware since, since ever really I had. Like, I, I didn't do anything to do with it. What about sexual offences? Are each of criminal responsibilities? For the partnerships. I know. <laughs> 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 we, 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 we feel to comply with Martin quite easily. Uh, speaking at the end of the table is Elaine Ferguson, uh, who is. Okay. Oh, oh. Uh, you know, you know yeah. her from Twitter. Yeah. I know from Twitter. Okay, but I, I've now heard a voice. That's fine. <laughs> you can see you. Know, I know basically. I, I know basically none of this stuff. I, I wasn't. I don't think the Royal Commission does a lot with criminal law. Certainly not. Well, certainly not at the moment. But, it's um, interesting. Sorry, it's probably one thing. Um, it's interesting to see this is an area where the stakeholders there is a sort of line down the middle between the landed and the, the want to have the land. Yes. Whereas it looks like certainly with certain bills that came from the Law Commission before, um, you've had two adverse responses from big law firms and the Scottish Parliament Committee just went, yeah, we're not continuing with this. Whereas this seems to be one where they're looking for a fight. Mm -hmm. It's true. What was that? But they oh, penalty clauses. And uh, mm -hmm. two firms say this might be not too good for con the construction industry. They just went, yeah, don't want the hassle. Yeah. I, I'm certainly... Um, at an earlier stage in terms of law commission's work, that there's a big chilling effect in terms of. Um, well, we saw that in the, the discussion that we had here when um, uh, Eric Tishima was speaking about defamation, and, and the chairman of the Scottish mm -hmm. Law Commission was here and was really terrified 
of it. <laughs> the idea that certain major stakeholders would, would object to what was being done, they basically seem to think that if that happened, there was no chance of it being successful at all. Uh, I have since heard that they are planning to be a little bit brave, but yeah. he said when he was here. So there we go. I'm always curious about the use of this term stakeholders when we talk about law reform. Okay. I find that quite, I, I find that quite interesting. Do you prefer consumers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find it odd that you can know, identify certain people before what these people are stakeholders. It might be that at a given point there's perhaps nobody directly in contact with an area of law that's going to be formed, but the notion that anybody's not a stakeholder in sweeping law reform I find, I find quite odd, actually. And especially if it's used as some kind of threshold device for deciding what to reform and what not, how to reform. Like a lot of law reform not the sort of stuff that we're talking about, not like the land reform stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, but not succession law, but maybe like abolition of the feudal system and real burdens and stuff. Although everybody, well, everybody who owns a house or whatever is technically affected by that in some way. Actually, most people just don't care. Like, I feel like the problem with law reform is not usually this absolute, you know, confrontation of political opinion we're getting on Twitter. <laughs> like, not like the problem is no one cares. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, so, you know, Jonathan Brown, sorry, from that uh, Strathclyde. That, that's one of the significant things about this idea that the Law Commission shouldn't get involved in the political area. Anything could be made politically contentious in the right uh, state of affairs. Anything can be removed from any sort of political con controversy as well. If you simply wait long enough or, or do it, then no one's looking really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Avoid telling stakeholders the situation there, um, but but that that does go on. Um, so I, I just find it difficult to to get my head around though is the idea that the, the law commission should shy away from this because I I've always been very taken with the the view that the law commission could do great work when it comes to um, the, the the whole mess of the law that pertaining to assisted suicide in Scotland because it, it's a the minute that you say that, it's like the air gets sucked out of the room. Everyone's like, good God, you're daring to mention that. That's the most political um, topic you could possibly mention. But the fact of the matter is we, we really don't know what the law in Scotland is just because there has been so much um, from all sides of the debate being thrown around. And I think it's, it, it would be perfectly possible for a, a dispassionate paper or a dispassionate report or memorandum to be produced by the Law Commission on that sort of topic. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most significant thing there would be, of course, that what Frankie said earlier, there would need to be some kind of policy guidance behind it. Um, the, the, the law would need to take some sort of significant step forward to, to indicate, well, this is where we want to go. We just can't get there in one big week. We need to, to work towards that. Yeah. And I think that the same is true of any area. I've just picked the most controversial one. I suppose that, you know, that's <coughs> looking at the Law Commission in, in two ways. It's obviously got a reform um, potency, but it's also got this actually bringing the law together and seeing how it is. Which certainly is where I think the Minimal Transactions Project, the discussion paper is, you know, quite almost as useful as a text. Yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. You're like, yeah, you're right. Johnny, I think maybe there's this distinction between policy and then theory and politics. So I'd like politics as well. Yeah. So but policy, you know, th that was discussed by the land farmer yeah. group. Theory of really actually trying to get some sort of architecture going with mm -hmm. this. Um, land form structure. I mean, I feel like we're going to end up with a bit of a mess. Yeah. And that's kind of a bit of a shame yeah. Yeah. because it, then it's difficult to use the law. Yeah. Well, do you think the Scottish Law Commission has ever engaged with the kind of Joseph Singer or Gregory Alexander type no, theoretical law? No, I don't think this is, I was like, when you were saying yeah, that, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking, but they don't, uh, like, I, 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 I mean, I think that kind of conceptual underpinning on that type, like, what is the purpose of property law type questions, or what purposes in society, in our society today, should property law be serving? That is, like, massively political, I think. I don't think that's legal at all. Do you not think that they could potentially discuss, because I was thinking about things like trusts 
as published in a feudal tenure, where they're really asking why they're making any changes. So that even they just start the process, it, they talk about something more than saying law is, uh, land is for the people of Scotland and we should sustainably develop and everything because of social justice. Like, it doesn't really say anything. It doesn't yeah. say anything and of course everybody would disagree with that. I yeah. think that's why the statement is there, but I mean, for me, I mean, coming at it as completely as a lay person, I find it hard to understand how you can embark on a project of reform or proposing a form of without a theoretical framework. I yeah. find it hard to understand how you can do that, even if it's not necessarily as deep as the kind of conversations that you would have as academics. So I sort of see where you I see where you are. In terms of redistributive justice, so we've got lots of chat about that. You know, people have been talking about that for quite a long period of time. Yeah. So there'd be an I think it would be quite easy in a sense to provide some sort of theoretical framework for this. I just think it would be, I mean, like, to address Aline's point about you can't do any, like, how could you do any kind of reform without a theoretical framework? But I think if you think about something like the form of the law of human burdens, I mean, what's this, like, I know you would I don't never think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's like, that's not something where there is an underlying, I mean, I suppose the underlying consensus is we need some sort of law of human burdens or some sort of private law restrictions on property ownership. Yeah. So, so is this a kind of academic desire, do you think? I, don't, I think it's not for land reform, yeah. but I just don't think it's true that you always need this. I think a lot of the work that law reform has done successfully, at least in property law in the past 50 years, doesn't have any big theoretical mm -hmm. questions unless you're going to actually unstitch the whole concept of yeah. property ownership, which nobody was suggesting. They're not even suggesting it now. Yeah. Land well, I don't, so I don't know about that. I think that they're always linking it to the general, they're always linking the reform to the general principles which make up the conceptual framework of Scots property law. But those, those, those general principles are much less, those aren't the kind of contested principles that the Singer and Alexander deal with. They're, no. they're things which everybody agrees on. So, I mean, we can take the example of the hurdles that are the projects on security that are going on at the moment. You know, like the, the movable transaction stuff, they explicitly say, well, that's kind of open to question whether we should have rights and security at all. There's strong economic arguments to present that it's a bad thing to have. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's the, a the paragraph in that that says, but we have them, and if we're going to have them, they should be well designed. Yeah. And I think that, on the whole, is what commissions are actually to kind of high level theory. And to my mind, that's maybe correct. Because. Well, yeah. I, I, oh, well, go ahead, you finish. I, I, I think I said it. Just on, I, I, know, I know nothing about law reform, about, about land law reform, yeah. but succession. Mm -hmm. Just take your example. Yeah. What did it continuously say? Yeah, one of those very well, well, technical things yeah. about yeah. Uh, um, formalities for will, you abolition of revocation of wills. Yeah. And Scottish Law Commission, as I recall, time and time again said, let's get rid of it, let's get rid of it. Clearly, speaking, is a fairly technical thing. Yeah. And then it ends up in the initial. It ended up in the technical bill, which mm -hmm. is going through, and yeah, let's abolish it. And then loads of academics came in, in fact, Roddy Paisley and the like, and pointed out there's a, probably a complete lack of holistic thinking from the Scottish Commission. Mm -hmm. you, they didn't think about those babies being thrown out with bathwaters, as it were, in terms of the unintended consequence of abolition, or what, how this relates to all gifts or policy issues. Those are the things were were completely left out, and so that particular thing moved over now to the the big bill, controversial yeah. stuff. So even the Scottish Law Commission, the Scottish Law Commission didn't do, didn't do much theoretical stuff. They should have, arguably. Mm -hmm. yeah. and there's two On terms terms of theory, though I think yeah. the, 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 yeah. those, uh, the the kind of conceptual deliberative theory that the Jill's talk about that it should this exist at yeah. all, and then there's what, what Johnny was saying there. And I always think that the perfect example in this sort of conversation is voting challenges. Um, and then just that, uh, I think it was Lord, Lord Cooper that said that voting challenges are ridiculous and should have no part, no part of Scots law. They just don't fit in with the jurisprudence of Scotland or um, anything else that's really legal systems. Uh, and then, of course, there's an act, the Voting Challenges Act, and suddenly we've got voting challenges. So th there are two questions there. One is, do important challenges have a place in the general jurisprudence of Scotland? The answer to that is no. 
how do you go about it on Google's way of thinking? Mm -hmm. The other question is, well, should we have voting challenges? And, and the answer to both of those questions can be quite different. It can be the same. It can be quite different. Um, and you can arrive at the same answer by very, very different, by way of very, very different types of reasoning there. Um, so when it comes to this sort of topic, again, I, I think Frankie's really had it. There needs to be a concept of the answer with the word deliberative question before um, the, you, you would ask the one commission to get involved almost. You would want to look at the why we're wanting to reform uh, land ownership and so on, why we're wanting to actually deal with this issue um, in the first place between the realm of politics and academia and come to this solution uh, which answers the deliberative question and then address the actual um, Legal question within the, the context of the positive system. Maybe we can ask, well, ask Malcolm what he thinks. In particular, I guess, Malcolm, you're probably more familiar with than the rest of us with the, the, um, the sort of background consideration of the theoretical arguments around land reform and, and the extent. I mean, do you think that the people that you're on the land reform machine group um, with had really thought, but sort of looked at this stuff and thought about it and just maybe didn't make it that explicit in the report or, or was it sort of outside their ken? Okay. I think it started off outside our ken, uh, and you had um, a few people, including me, um, pointing out that maybe there should be a bit more in the way of legal involvement and legal theory to underpin it, because um, the only legal advisor who was sort of on the team to start with was a chap called Simon Fraser, who has been involved in various community buyouts over the years. So he had very particular skills, but he wasn't looking at it from a let's think about native title and what happens in Australia, or let's think about what they've been doing in South Africa. He was kind of looking at it from the very empirical, let's think about how I managed to help the Assen Crofters acquire their land. Um, so, yeah, but then I, I think it came around a bit, and people started to realise, well, we, we really do need to think about what ownership means, and... Every so often you'd have other people sort of jumping up and down saying, oh no, it's not about ownership, it's about use. But then uh, someone like me would come back and go, well, yeah, try separating them out um, when the, the sort of right of ownership gives you um, such, a, such a, a strong hand and that got it back to a, a sort of theoretical sort of, well, a counter argument to the uh, let's just let us keep owning this because we are going to change the way it's used. Well, you've still got quite a big agenda setting role there. Um, I was wondering if we should maybe steal a conversation to something else entirely uh, and feel free <laughs> to sort of steal me away from this a little bit. Have you mentioned the Scottish Land Commission yet today? No, we haven't. Well, let's talk about the other SLC. Because how does the new SLC sit with the old SLC? Because presumably they're going to have different roles. But the thing was that the Land Reform Review Group, a bit like the Napier Commission from the 19th century, was a single purpose Scottish Land Commission. It was sort of set up for a time, as opposed to this idea that we will have a top-down, state-led land reform institution that will be there henceforth, looking at things which might be law related, it might be policy, planning, development related, environment related, whatever, whatever the things that they, they list in their uh, sort of the, the, the skill sets they're after and what they should be looking at. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all very well talking about this reform process, but what about future reform processes if you end up with another quango? Mm -hmm. See, I'm interested in whether when the things about the, the Land Commission, Interested in whether the land rights and responsibilities statement is going to embody some of this underlying theoretical framework that is currently missing. Mm -hmm. Not that I think the land rights and responsibilities statement is going to say, oh, land ownership in Scotland embodies Gregory Alexander's <laughs> <laughs> or, although that would be nice. Well, but, well uh, <laughs> yeah. But whether it's going to like have some like whether is it going to be like more of a kind of South African constitution kind of a deal where it is going to say more than well I don't really know what it's going to say so but that's if it did maybe that would be a way of you know overcoming some of that lack of theoretical discussion in the land reform bill itself 
and then maybe the land commission would then be in that role of doing the kind of detailed stuff with the policy already yeah. worked out that Johnny's kind of put on the idea of the law commission would be, if that makes sense. Yes. So they would be the bridge. Well, yes, yeah, so yeah. the land rights and responsibility statement is the policy statement, and then yeah. the land commission are doing detailed stuff. And then I suppose the Scottish Law Commission doesn't need to be involved in land report yeah. anymore. I, yeah. oh, 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 the, my, my understanding was that, that the intention of the Scottish Land Commission was that it was going to be focused much more on land use. Yeah. I, I, I mean land use in the broad sense. Um, so I, I think that we can say that the Scottish Law Commission's primary concern is with legal design. It's, it's concerned with how rules can be designed to deliver particular outcomes. Whereas the, my understanding of what the Land Commission is supposed to do is to be a, a step closer to policy than, than that and to come up with and to monitor the operation of specific policies as they deliver these presumably relatively broad brush yeah. schemes. Um, I also thought they were going to have some kind of supervisory function over the ten farming commissioners really remarkably extensive powers but apparently not. Um, the, the ten and farming commissioner is going to be a guy important person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, absolutely. I take it you are worried about the Land Commission, Malcolm, based on the way you asked that question. No, I mean, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, I, 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 I want to know, um, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm curious myself as to what, what it's going to be like going forward. I mean, there was an idea the Commission proposed in the Land Reform Review Group, the Scottish Land and Property Commission, I think, was what it was going to be called to start with. Then in the sort of first cut of the consultation, it was called, called the Scottish Land Reform Commission, which would have given a very good steer as to what it was about. Uh, but I think reform is obviously quite loaded to have in the title of such a body, so Scottish Land Commission might be a bit more palatable to lots of people to, to deal with. But yeah, I mean, in terms of... Um, you never know with these things until they get going. Um, and I, I was one, it was more just in the context of comparing and contrasting it with, um, yeah, because the, the, the Scottish Law Commission is there, and it's been there since, what, the 50s, um, to, to look out for things with a sort of broader remit um, than, than just sort of individual sort of ad hoc studies. And with land stuff, We've, it's sort of been irregular ad hocery. Um, may, I mean, uh, the idea of having something looking at it with a degree of continuity, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly am keener on than people sort of sw sort of swooping in every sort of 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but yeah, uh, that's a, again another rambling answer. Sorry. No, no, it's good. So, but was your sense that it would be closer to sort of land use type issues than yeah. to, to sort of technical? Land use or? and um, sort of possibly the idea of steering the odd policy direction. Obviously, yeah. can make recommendations and can sort of uh, suggest directions for government in the future. But it, it wouldn't be involved necessarily in drafting legal rules per se. It yeah. would be involved in drafting codes of practice. Uh, it seems. Um, and these codes of practice will suddenly have teeth in relation to the tenant farming sector in a way that they haven't thus far, which is again why the tenant farming commissioner would be very important, and yeah, we'll need to see what happens in that regard. So, but, yeah, sorry, I mean, is it just the tenant farming commissioner who's coming up with that code of practice in the zone, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. so the, and, and as we've learned, the, the, the SNC or something definitely just share a building. And some other yeah. stuff. But he's but he's one of them, so yeah, yeah, of them. Yeah. Apart from when he's in a farming commissioner. Apart from when he's yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. Um, um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, someone else help me. Sorry, I've lost my thread. Uh, 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 I, I, I I think where you were going was that although um, we don't envisage the, the, the Scottish Land Commission having a kind of a, 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 a legislative role, nonetheless they have quite, at least 
through the medium of the Tenant Department Commissioner, but then that specific area, um, they have quite an important rulemaking rule, rule which has legal consequences because they comply with these yeah. sort of practice can, create, can result in adverse legal consequences for you. And perhaps we might envisage similar codes of practice in relation to other areas of land use being drawn up by the rest of the source land commission. Yeah. Um, that wouldn't be surprising, I don't think. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, provided that there was sufficient scrutiny of what they're doing. Um, and who the commissioners are. Indeed, yes. <coughs> I, mean, I suppose that's always an issue. Yeah. Um, well, we, I mean, potentially who a Scottish Law Commissioner is, is quite contentious too, but we tend not to know it's because it's all our <laughs> <laughs> I think. Okay, I've got another question yeah. that was on a tangent, but since we're talking about law reform. Yeah. Right, so one thing I'm struggling with at the moment is how far do, how do you separate out your academic opinions from your personal political opinions Whoa. when <laughs> the, the crossover is not okay. So I think about this because in property law stuff, this doesn't tend to be so much of a problem because if I've got a very strong view on the form of Section 52 and 53 of the Tell Condition Scotland Act or something, which I probably do. That, that's not my personal political opinion, that's definitely just about my academic understanding of property law. But if I've got an opinion on something like equal marriage from the family law side of things, I probably do have academic opinions on that from the perspective of like equality law, human rights law or something, but I also do have personal political opinions on that, which, you know, are that we should obviously, well, we do now, but we should have equal marriage. So when it comes to something like land reform, then my impression is that there's a, a range, or like a full spectrum of political opinions that you see in the discussion among Scottish legal academics, particularly, or you mean between us? Yeah, I don't think you do all the time, no, Johnny. Inherently in your approach to <laughs> that's a significant thing though. A lot of the time you won't notice yeah. if you've done it or not until you go back and read something that you've written or like where you see you're, you're working on it instead of um, about actually creating the piece rather just, oh Frankie said something interesting, I'm going to go look and see if I've expressed a view, oh bloody hell I have, mm -hmm. uh, quite strongly. It, it's not yeah. something that you're naturally conscious to. And, and, uh, if anyone can figure out how to reconcile that problem, that'd be interesting. It's <laughs> not necessarily a problem. I mean, if what you produce is, is the logical, rational, kind of evidence based, I mean, everything is going to be open to interpretation or whatever. And everything, everything that makes you up as a verbism, as an academic, whether it's politics, religious, religion, it's all going to, you know, your work is going to be filtered to that. I don't think it's a problem. I think it just adds to a variety of arguments and opinions. I suppose what I worry about is like with something like land reform. So like I probably do have quite strong personal views that we should be doing a hell of a lot more land reform than we're doing, and we just should just get rid of ownership and just live in some sort of market state or something. <laughs> <laughs> you were right, 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 right,
uh, one would hope at least that we are able to articulate and to develop those views in the kind of theoretical terms that Jill was talking about. That's much better than people just banging the table and saying, I want this. And if we want to make that part of our work, then we should. But I don't think we should feel like we have to. We should also feel like we can make narrow technical points um, and that say, well, if we assume that this is a policy, then this, this delivers or, 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 or doesn't um, deliver it. But for that reason, I don't, I don't think we need to worry too much about that, that boundary. It's my opinion. I think, this, I think it's quite, I thought of this when I was writing my PhD, that often what has been taught, what has been achieved in Scottish property law so far is amazing and brilliant, but there is actually a kind of political undertone that isn't, um, isn't explicit. And I realised this when I went to South Africa where I was talking about how brilliant Roman Dutch law was. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and is it brilliant, is it brilliant? And then just realised it was a, a tool of oppression. But of course it wasn't necessarily um, it wasn't explicitly said this is a tool of oppression, but it was just, you know, oh, we should have this absolute right of ownership of being able to evict everyone off our land. Um, so I think politics really does influence my academic work. And it, 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 I feel like it's quite important. I felt like it was quite important. My first statement giving evidence was that I support the agenda of land reform. Yeah. Actually, and you were telegraphed pen up by then, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, 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 you, you get that my view, my views were taken by one side, unjustifiably, um, and I wanted to correct it, you know, because it was the first time that I'd actually really had to. Say, I would feel like I'd be happy to say, you know, I do like, I do like Roman law. I read the Guardian. Um, I like Scots law as a different legal system. You know, it's, I'm very happy to say those things because they do actually influence what I write about everything. Yeah. And um, but it makes me, after the South African experience, it makes me slightly nervous to not want to explicitly say it out loud because it, I wonder in not expressing or not acknowledging what is influencing your your writing behind behind the shield of objectivity, what is actually going on? But maybe we differ on that. <laughs> well, I think you, you, it, it depends what you consider to be the presuppositions in which you operate. Mm -hmm. So you can say, with, you know, given these assumptions, you know, assuming you clearly enjoy the I believe this. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. universes are possible. to say very quickly, um, one is that, yeah, I mean, I, I've stopped trying to separate out the politics of it because, well, the very fact I've been writing about this for as long as I have, yeah, I'm interested in it. Of course I am. Um, and actually, it was my dissertation at Strathclyde Uni, Scott Wortley marked it, and in feedback afterwards, there was something along the lines of, yeah, there's a bit of an undercurrent here, Malcolm, isn't there? It's like, yeah, it's not <laughs> it's an undertow, uh, t sweeping it away. But there we go. And then, yeah. Recently, I was out, uh, I was out socially with a friend who works at the Hutton Institute, um, and she sort of said, "Yeah, it's bloody obvious your position, Malcolm." And it's like, "Yeah, okay, fine." You know, I'm, I, I try my best to be equal. I try to put forward a, as many sort of positions as I can. But yeah, if I was perfectly happy with exactly how the law was at the moment, yeah, I wouldn't be writing what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. On oh, that heartwarming note, <laughs> we can um, draw our conclusions. And particularly, thank Malcolm for persisting in the face yeah. of yeah. Yeah. university yeah. IT yeah. systems. Thank you. Um, and to tell everyone that um, at least I will be back here, hopefully, everyone else will be back here too on the 13th of January, where uh, I'll be Lindsay, sitting over there, and um, we'll be talking about penalty clauses. And I believe that the SLC will get comments. So. Looking forward to seeing you all then. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay, folks. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.